Good morning. My name is Sabina. I'm one of the medical students. Can I have your name and date of birth? Aiden on 29th of November, 1979. And may I call you Aiden? Yeah. Thank you. So this morning I've been asked to examine your cardiovascular system, which is going to involve me having a look at you and commenting on my findings. I'll also need to touch parts of your upper body, including your face, your neck, your chest, and your arms. And then I'll have a listen with my stethoscope. Do I have your consent for this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you in any pain this morning? Uh, no. And if that changes at any point, please let me know and we can stop the exam. For the purpose of this exam, I do need to have access to your chest. Would you be comfortable removing your shirt and your socks for me? Yeah, that's okay. At this point, if you have a female patient, you can ask if they'd like a chaperone. Um, to maintain their dignity, you can allow them to remain covered until it's necessary to expose them for the exam. Now that he's properly exposed, I'll position the bed at 45 degrees and I'll raise the patient's feet. Right. I'll begin with general inspection from the end of the bed. From the end of the bed, the patient appears comfortable and well. There's no obvious signs of pallor. I don't note any visible pulsations, scars, or skeletal deformities from the end of the bed. I also don't see any IV drips, oxygen mask, nasal prongs, or medications around the bed. Ideally, I'd like to measure the patient's BMI. However, at this point, he appears to be of normal habitus. I'll move on to closer inspection of the patient's hands. Can you put your hands out like this for me, please? I'll begin by examining for signs of clubbing, which would be indicated by fluctuance of the nail bed and loss of the longitudinal angle of the nail. Another way to check for clubbing is to assess for Shamrock's window. Can you put your fingers together like this? And you should see a window in between the patient's nails, which is present, indicating that there's no clubbing. If you could put your hands back out for me. I'll now check for peripheral cyanosis, which would be blue discoloration of the fingers, um, tar staining, which would be a yellow or brown discoloration of the fingers, and splinter hemorrhages in the nail beds, none of which are present. Can you flip your hands for me? I'll assess for pallor of the palmar creases by comparing the color of the palmar crease to the color of the rest of the hands. There's no pallor of the palmar creases. And I'll assess for xanthoma in the hands, which would be fatty deposits in the thinner muscles. You can relax your hands there. There's no xanthoma present in the hands. I'll now move on to assessment of the patient's radial pulse. I'll palpate the patient's radial pulse and count ideally for one minute, but in the interest of time, I'll count for 15 seconds and multiply by four. The patient's pulse is 72 beats per minute with a normal rate and rhythm. I'll comment on character and volume of the pulse when I examine the carotids. I'd like to take the patient's blood pressure as well at this time. I'll now move on to closer inspection of the patient's face, beginning with the eyes. Can you open your eyes nice and wide for me? I'm observing for corneal arcus, which would be seen as a white ring around the corneal margin, which is not present. And can you pull your lower lids down for me? And I'm assessing for pallor of the conjunctiva, which is not present. You can relax there. Lastly, I'll check for xanthelasma under the eyes, which would be fatty deposits under the skin, um, which are not present in this patient. I'll move on to the patient's mouth, looking around the mouth for signs of peripheral cyanosis around the lips. Um, and then I'll use my torch to examine inside the patient's mouth. Can you open your mouth for me? And lift your tongue. All right. Um, there's no central cyanosis under the patient's tongue and dentition appears normal. I'll now move on to assessment of the patient's jugular venous pressure. Can you turn your face to the wall there? I'll observe in between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid for a visible pulsation. Once I see a pulsation, I'll assess whether it's venous or arterial um, by palpating it. If it's palpable, it's an arterial pulse, and if it is not palpable, it's venous. The pulse is not palpable, so that indicates that it is the patient's jugular vein. I'll measure the height of the jugular venous pressure using two rulers, 
one positioned at the manubrious sternal angle and one horizontally from the height of the pulsation and compare where the two rulers meet to find the vertical measurement, which is approximately two centimeters. A normal reading is anything below three centimeters. I'll now move on to assessment of the patient's carotid pulse, palpating medially to the sternocleidomastoid for 15 seconds again. Patient's pulse is 72 beats per minute with a normal character and normal volume. I'll now move on to closer inspection of the patient's precordium, looking for scars, visible pulsations, skeletal abnormalities, or signs of an implanted cardiac device, none of which are present in this patient. I'll move on to palpation of the patient's apex beat, beginning with a flat hand in the axilla and moving medially. If the patient has breast tissue, it may be necessary to lift the breast tissue, which the patient would be, might be more comfortable doing themselves. Once I locate the apex beat, I'll localize it with two fingers. Once I've localized the apex beat, I'll check for regular placement by counting down from the second intercostal space, two, three, four, and five, and finding the approximate midpoint of the clavicle the apex beat should be in the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line, which it is on this patient. I'll now move on to precordial impulses, beginning with parasternal heave. I'll place the heel of my hand on the patient's left sternal border with my fingers raised off the patient's chest. If a parasternal heave is present, I would feel my hand lift with each systole, which would be indicative of right ventricular hypertrophy. There's no heave present in this patient. I'll now move on to palpating four thrills with a flat hand in each of the four cardiac areas. A thrill would be felt as a palpable vibration against the palm of my hand, which is indicative of turbulent flow across the valves. There are no thrills present in this patient. Finally, I'll move on to auscultation, starting with the diaphragm and then the bell of my stethoscope in each of the four cardiac areas while palpating the patient's radial pulse. On auscultation, heart sounds one and two were present with no additional sounds and no appreciable murmurs. Um, to conclude this exam, I would like to examine the patient's ankles and sacrum for edema, as well as auscultate the lung basis. Thank you very much. Thanks.